Ever since games first hit the mainstream, they've had this really intriguing relationship with cheating. By definition, cheating isn't something that you should be proud of and should be derided, but it all depends if you consider games to be super serious and not something you can mess around with in your own time. Or unless you just really want to show people that you're amazing at Minecraft. Personally, I love the whole dynamic surrounding cheating in a game, so long as it doesn't give you an advantage over other people who aren't cheating. The time I've spent doing ridiculous things in Grand Theft Auto because of the cheats I had enabled is memorable, because few games out there let you go crazy in a game-breaking kind of way. What's even more interesting than that, though, is the dichotomy the developers struggle with when handling cheating. Should we allow it to happen, or should we push back onto the player a bit and remind them that cheating rarely comes without consequences? These consequences may well end up being incredibly entertaining, and so that's kind of why I'm here. Making a video that's been done to death by everyone else, but something that I haven't tackled until today. It's a momentous occasion for a number of reasons, because this video is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends, who have been very busy recently adding a ton of new content to their hit RPG strategy game, where you can flex your tactical muscles by using the millions of different champion combinations to take down the Ice Golem, and the Demon Lord, and this big funky spider, and maybe even the millions of real players in the arena. Personally, I really like the arena, because all those tactics you've been working on for so long, and upgrading your champions, and making sure that all their, all the gear is good and well enhanced and everything comes together and when it works so well it's really satisfying to have steamroll opponents. Back when I first started the first champion I got was El Hain and she is very good at killing lots of people very quickly and you know dang she's strong. This month Raider kicking things into high gear with a packed schedule of summer events and activities like special fusion events for a new legendary champion, tournaments against other players and five brand new champions that I can't wait to get my hands on. Cleoterex has giant wings, and I am a fan. With all these massive updates on the way, there's no better time to get started with Raid Shadow Legends, and if you want to get a huge head start, all you have to do is hit the link in the description or scan this QR code that's been in this corner the whole time. Doing this as a new player will net you an epic hero, Chonaru, 200,000 silver, 1 XP boost, 1 energy refill, and 1 ancient shard for summoning a powerful champion. All of which can be found in the top right corner here, but only for the next 30 days, so you better be quick. Once you're in, you can find me in-game under the name Rabbit Luigi, and if you're super fast, you can even join my clan. I'll see you in the raid. Alrighty then, should we punish some cheaters? If you think that a game dishing out any punishment to cheaters is ultimately meant to teach them a lesson through some weird fourth ball breaking acknowledgement, you want to make the punishment as relevant as possible. That is, if you're trying to make a point and not simply demoralize a cheater until they retreat into their shell like some amorphous blob of crap, never to be seen again. But sometimes you're not dealing with someone who is exploiting cheats so they can have an easier time. Piracy is incredibly widespread in the gaming industry, and it's a problem that sadly isn't going away anytime soon. And I suppose it's fortunate that some games are able to detect when a player is using a non-legit copy and are able to screw with them in a variety of creative ways. There's a few examples that I wanted to pick and likely would have found space for if this video was bigger, but in the end, it came down to looking for the right amount of irony to put a satisfying full stop on the whole issue. That's the funny thing when you're playing a game about creating video games, if you then start addressing the idea of game piracy, you kind of have their attention. And also mine. Every time I played Game Dev Tycoon, it's been a fairly enjoyable experience where it never gets too complicated, even when you're designing your own video game console, but generally there's a lot to explore and do, and it kept every playthrough reasonably fresh. That being said, didn't really know about the whole piracy thing, mainly because I bought my game with actual money. I suppose you can argue that piracy isn't on the same line as proponents of using cheat codes, but what is piracy if not cheating at life and activating the code that lets you get a game for free? Whatever, I don't really care, but I do care a lot about how Game Dev Tycoon decided to address the problem by introducing a few lines of code among pirated copies that, true to life, result in your new creations being pirated in-game. That's honestly incredible, and I love wherever that spark of inspiration came from to stack up piracy in some incredibly delicious slice of irony, but it's implemented in such a way that teaches the user of the pirated copy just how piracy affects a developer and how it feels to have your work exploited like this. 
Once you fail to turn a significant profit for long enough, you'll trip over bankruptcy and that's game over. But it actually presents a unique challenge for game dev tycoon that likely wouldn't have arisen organically. After a while, Greenheart Games updated the game with a new ultra-hard difficulty mode called Pirate Mode that voluntarily puts your save game in the same situation as pirated copies. Bankruptcy is likely, but not guaranteed, and it's the hard mode that this game always needed. Thank you, pirates, you've done it again! Given how strict Nintendo are with the intellectual properties that usually manifest itself as DMCA takedowns and lawsuits, you'd have to imagine that they have some pretty strong words to say against cheaters and pirates and do everything in their power to stop the people from doing the bad things. And yeah, they definitely do that, but it's not as much as I would have liked. I want like a, a crazy explosion of legal fury. Even then, Banjo-Kazooie is definitely more of a rare project than a Nintendo one, with a lot of the game's design and writing a very far cry from Nintendo's typically inoffensive style. I would love to see Nintendo do more to fight piracy beyond swinging their big intellectual property balls from side to side, taking out everything in sight, and include a few more nifty details exclusive to those individuals who decided not to buy their game. I think Earthbound did some crazy things. Banjo-Kazooie, meanwhile, doesn't have much in the way of defense from piracy, but since we're also including cheats in this strange directionless video held by someone who is making this shit up as he goes along, we should probably talk about how Banjo-Kazooie gets really funky if you start using the wrong cheats. Yeah, there's a short list of cheats that the game is generally okay with you using, but there's an even shorter list of illegal cheats that are less okay to use. Oh, fuck, am I going to jail now? What constitutes an illegal cheat pretty much boils down to accessing areas in the game that would usually require puzzle pieces or moving stuff out of the way. And hey, Banjo-Kazooie definitely has codes that allow you to unlock every area in the game, but evidently, either Rare don't want you to use too many of them, or they've programmed Gruntilda to be a little pissed off that you're skipping so many parts of her lair. Either way, after two of these cheats, she'll threaten to delete your save file, and should you ignore her, she'll kick your game pack to the curb. But I'm still here. Hello? Why am I why am I still here? Well, that's the thing, because Rare injected this scenario with an extra dose of cruelty. Because the prospect of one of their games deleting your save file is as believable as seeing Eternal Darkness pull the same trick, and seeing Banjo walk around unscathed makes you think that it was just Rare and Grunty messing around. However, if you lose all your lives or turn the N64 off and even save and quit, you'll be sent back to the title screen where you'll find out for yourself that Gruntilda did in fact delete your save data. Just the fact that you can save and quit to potentially retrieve the situation, and it's actually the process by which your save data ceases to exist? That's so cruel, I love it! Why couldn't Gruntilda do this when she's losing the boss fight? Always good to have a backup plan. Considering how fourth wall breaky all of this is, it should come as absolutely no surprise to anyone that the Stanley Parable has one of these too. Admittedly, this isn't a game that facilitates the use of cheats since there's too much walking and exploring the bounds of the story to care too much about being good at the Stanley Parable. And in fact, cheating at this game probably takes the form of searching the internet for how to unlock all of the game's very creatively designed endings. Nah, no, seriously, the likelihood of finding all these without resorting to a flowchart like this one has to be extremely low. And just so you'd likely need prior knowledge in order to discover half of these endings, you need to know what you're looking and how you want to find it if you want the Stanley Parable's most serious ending. Or you're one of those crazy fools who activates cheats in the console just to see what happens. Typing SV underscore cheats1 into the console activates cheat mode in most games that run on the Source engine, and is available to server admins in games like Team Fortress 2 and CSGO. But in a single player game like the Stanley Parable, there has to be a specific use for the cheats, and hey ho, there definitely is. It happens so fast, but as soon as you enable those cheats, you're whisked off to the serious room with a very serious table, where the narrator will explain to you the drawbacks of cheating and how it can break the game. You just tried to activate server cheats, which of course runs the risk of breaking the entire game. You can actually stack up a few more inputs of SV underscore cheats one with some new dialogue each time, but by the fourth input, the narrator will give up and leave you to all of your seriousness. I get some serious Mr. Rossetti vibes from the Stanley Parable's serious room, and for once, that is not a bad thing at all. 
It's not quite as lengthy as Mr. Rossetti rambling at you, but it does resemble the actions of a character with some acknowledgement of the fourth wall, attempting to lecture you on everything that you've done wrong, and actually the Stanley Parable has an advantage since the whole point of this game is breaking rigid narrative structures and nothing is more destructive to predetermined destiny than turning on server cheats. Are we at a point in this video where the punishments are narratively relevant to the video game? Those are some mighty high standards to keep up. So we've covered conventional cheating through codes that developers have allowed to exist within the game as some kind of hidden content, and we've also covered piracy that is kind of like cheating but in more of a real world sense, and when you look at it like that, they are two polar opposite ends of roughly the same spectrum. What I'm going to try and do now is, is find that midpoint, and I think the best way of doing that is by tackling your friend and mine, the Game Shark. Oh no, be careful not to get bitten. I remember a period in my life when I had a Game Shark for the Nintendo DS, which I got almost entirely out of curiosity of what it would do to some of the games I owned. It's more of a brute force form of cheating that lets you activate cheat codes that forcibly alter data within the game to give you infinite lives or instantly unlock everything, or really just about anything that you want to happen can be done with the right code. It presents a quandary for game developers though, since while the cheats are mostly harmless, they will often undermine the core experience of playing a game, and if left unchecked on games of multiplayer, can give unfair advantages to cheating players. So maybe some devs want to clamp down on this before everything gets out of hand, and hey, would you look at that! It's Rare doing something crazy for Nintendo on the N64 again! Oh, Donkey Kong, what's happening, man? If you ever wanted an indication that introducing cheats to the wrong game might affect it negatively, like peeing in a swimming pool, then I implore you to check out what happens when a game shark starts chowing down on Donkey Kong 64, because hot oh, damn, it gets pretty grisly. Depending on what code you use, Donkey Kong starts glitching out on the title screen, almost as a prelude to show off how big of a mistake you've made. Certain Game Shark codes don't mix well with this game, and when you're trying to play it, this couldn't be more obvious. Oh yeah, that was the final boss just there, don't worry about it. It's actually really hard to explain with any kind of accuracy, but the entire framework of Donkey Kong 64 breaks down with the wrong animations, bizarre camera changes, and just a whole load of stuff that seems to change every time at random intervals. This feels like an overreaction to Game Shark being introduced, but Rare were hiding one last fuck you to the player, because if you save the game in this state, these glitches never go away, and you're permanently stuck with a barely playable version of Donkey Kong 64. It's alright though, because there's videos online about it, and that means I don't have to ruin any of my games to witness this. Thank you YouTube for making it fun to see cheaters punished. It's definitely not over the top, not at all. Cheating in a single player game is one thing that flies in the face of the developer's original intentions, but quite often it'll be with in-game cheat codes and so you can legislate for a bit of leeway from the devs. Multiplayer games are completely different though, since your cheating directly affects other players who haven't stooped to such a level just because the base game is too challenging or you want an easy fast track to a higher level or better gear. There are literally hundreds of ways to cheat in an online game, and while most games kick the guilty player off the server and likely ban them from ever returning, we're in the business of far more dramatic punishments. Since cheating on an online game is a bit more of a serious crime, I think Guild Wars making a public display that doubles as a public execution is wild and perhaps a bit over the top, but not gonna lie, immensely satisfying. I bet the French Revolution was fun. You know, I suppose a simple VAC ban would be effective at kicking cheaters out of online games, but the fact that Guild Wars goes out of its way to summon Doom, which is spelt with an H and a couple of U's, the God of Death and Lord of the Underworld, who does exist in the game as a more conventional boss fight, but also has a far more interesting purpose, it's kind of a sign that they mean business. Whenever the game is able to hone in on a player who is obviously cheating or hacking, Guild Wars will sick doom on them, who will then execute the player with one swing of his scythe for insta-kill damage that sets the player on fire, sends their soul to the underworld, and then also bans the player just for good measure. I get why this is here, because evidently cheaters need to be made an example of, and this is an exceptionally powerful way to do that, but I almost feel bad for the hacker. 
it's such a swift end to their bullshit that they probably feel like they've wasted all their time to put all these cheats in place just for this giant god of death to kill them immediately. For everyone else though, it's a beautiful sight to behold as this giant grim reaper executes another cheater. I'll be a good boy now, I swear. This is Rebel Luigi and seeing someone executed so publicly in Guild War speaks to our desire to need to see bad people punished for their misdeeds. It kind of reminds me of how a lot of other games with their hackers, they don't even report back on the status when you report them. They don't, they don't tell you what happened to the person who ruined your game. Meanwhile, Guild Wars is over here giving such beautiful visual confirmation to that fact. I also love how quick it is. Like, Doom doesn't really need to expend any extra energy, he just gets it over with as quickly as possible. Frankly, I don't think they deserve any more than that. <laughs> Hi, just want to give a quick shout out to some of my top supporters on Patreon. We have Ramon Alberto, Jerome Kiryu, Fusion Warrior, Sarah Malion, Christopher Robinson, Joe Creamer, Scott Riker, Frank Giong, I think, I'm, I'm so sorry, The Green Scorpion, Devon Hutt, and Ferretto. Thank you all for supporting what I do on YouTube, and if you want to join them, you can go to patreon.com forward slash rabbitluigi, where I post updates and behind the scenes stuff, and we generally have a really good time. Also, what topic would you like to see me cover next? Leave your suggestion in the comment on this video, because I'll be taking the best ideas and making a poll on my community tab, which you can then vote on to decide what the next video is about. I'll be announcing the winner of the poll over on my Twitter, so make sure you follow me so you don't miss out. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.